takes a long slides. Uh, no, you, you will do that. Right, let's just... Hi, everyone. Uh, let's get started. No, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, There's nobody on, here. Hold on, hold on. Perfect. Good. Okay. Uh, let's quickly wave at the remote participants. They can all see us. That's excellent. Wave over there. So Roman, can you see us, Roman? <laughs> Folks are perfect. I, I can see you. It's not some kind of deep speak. Good. Cool. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, great to see you um, in person, finally. Um, lots of uh, familiar faces, some new faces too, which is great. And um, hopefully this is just a, a beginning of uh, better days, hopefully, uh, more more face-to-face -face meetings. So welcome to the OAuth working group. And let's get going. Uh, this is the not well, so um, if you're not familiar with this, um, especially for those new faces here, please make sure to get familiar with this. This uh, governs everything that we do uh, at the IETF, and it's important that you may know uh, this stuff, right? So take your time and, and spend uh, some time uh, looking at this. Um, Again, because this is uh, our first time doing um, kind of a, a hybrid model uh, type of um, um, conference. So if you are in person, um, make sure that use, uh, you use a meet echo. Um, and this is uh, the on-site tool, please. So, um, and um, you will use that to join the queue, even if you are in person here. Um, and um, you keep the audio and video obviously off. Uh, and for remote participants, uh, again, um, you can um, make sure that audio and video are off unless you wanna um, present or, um, or say something. And uh, we highly encourage you that to use, to use a, a, a headset. So now we have, um, a few sessions. Uh, so this this our first session for this week. Uh, another the other official session is uh, on Thursday, at the same time. Uh, we have also two um, side meetings. Um, one on Tuesday tomorrow at two, and one on Wednesday at six um, p.m. Um, everyone is welcome to attend. Um, again, it's it's public um, meetings, so anyone um, can attend those too. A quick work, work group updates. First, um, um, RFC 9207 was published. Uh, congratulations to Daniel um, and um, I think Creston. I don't think he's here, right? Uh, congratulations, uh, guys. And uh, thanks for everyone who contributed to that document and reviewed and provide feedback. So awesome work. Thank you. Uh, RFC uh, edit queue, we have uh, one uh, JOT response for our token introspection. Um, I think uh, we're just waiting for this to go through. Um, we can't do much about this. Uh, worker consensus, we have, um, uh, the first one is uh, 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 Christina's and Mike's document. Uh, is uh, a simple document. We progressed very, very well, uh, very quickly. So. Uh, we have consensus on this one, and we will uh, make progress on this one soon. Uh, the security BCP has been languishing for a long time. Uh, you can blame the chairs for this. So uh, we started doing more work around this. So <laughs> um, we did um, review it uh, myself, and uh, Hannes is in the process of, of doing it. He's halfway through this. Um, do, do you want to? Okay, we have to. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, now I'm muffled. Uh, 
so Hannes is uh, halfway through this uh, document, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll make progress on this one uh, soon. Uh, uh, on the raw document, uh, we kind of uh, dropped the ball on this one, and uh, we will pick it up uh, soon. So um, we will start working on this one too. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Daniel, for doing an update of the document following the reviews that we did. Uh, so the next step is the Shepherd write-up. Uh, the IPR, uh, I think, uh, so if I correctly memorize it, for the RAW document? Yeah. No? Thorsten. It was Thorsten. Yeah. You're right. Okay, not yeah. Daniel. <laughs> okay. That's fine. But it's uh, the same status. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. thanks, Thorsten. I don't know if he's online. I didn't see him. Okay. Um, so that's uh, the update. Do we have any, any questions, any comments about this? Okay. Uh, so here is our agenda uh, beside the chair's update. Um, Mike, uh, sorry, Brian, we'll start. Oh, go ahead, uh, Mike. So all the last three, this is Mike Jones from Microsoft. All the last three documents are waiting Shepherd reviews? Yes. Okay. So, um, Brian will start with uh, Depop. Um, uh, after that, um, I'll be talking about three direction attacks, and uh, Aaron will, uh, will finish with OAuth 2.1. So, that's for today. And uh, for Thursday, we have a device flow, um, and Peter will, will talk about this. Um, uh, Vittorio will talk about step up authentication. Uh, um, Brian will be um, in supporting role. And uh, Daniel will <laughs> will be talking about libraries there on, on, on Thursday. So yeah, I have lots of interesting stuff to to, to discuss. Um, any questions, or comments, suggestions, personal attacks on the chairs? <laughs> okay, good, Brian. Um, are you wanna, how, I don't know how to do that, hold on. I don't know how to do this either. Do you want to advance or? Uh, I think you have to, like, yeah. just advance down. There. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, like he wanted to control it from his. I don't, no, no, no. no. Okay, no, then, then let's, no, let's, no, let's, let's. Just have you do that. Yeah, yeah, okay. just, just let me know and progress it. All right, ready to roll? Yep. All right, uh, welcome. Nice to see everybody in person again. Uh, here we go. This is weird. This is really weird, uh, so bear with me. Uh, so Depop, OAuth 2, demonstrating proof of possession at the application layer. Uh, threw in a picture up here for IETF. This is on the other side of Austria, though, so <laughs> close, but not quite. Uh, is so your mic on? Sorry? Is your mic on? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Is it, is it just, <clears throat> what if I speak a little louder? Okay, I will try to speak louder. All right, next slide, please. Man, this is awkward. Yeah. All right, little expectation setting here. I got 45 minutes, hopefully not going to use it all. Uh, got a little jet lag, so again, bear with me. Um, I'm going to do a full overview of the DPOP protocol, um, trying to note particular places uh, explicitly where changes have occurred recently. Um, I know some of you have seen this before, so I apologize for any repetition, but I find it a lot easier to talk about things in context of the overall change, and then I'll wrap things up. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So, Depop, the objectives of Depop, really quickly and in general, providing a pragmatic application level proof of possession mechanism for OAuth 2 access tokens and refresh tokens when they're issued to public clients. The pragmatic was a little bit qualified prior. It, it is still pretty pragmatic, but it's maybe not as simple as it once was. And it's not terribly efficient because it uses public key cryptography on basically every request, but that is uh, sort of the price of admission and where we've ended up with things, but I wanted to point that out and just head it off right at the beginning. Uh, next. So it has been a while. Uh, last time we were all together was IETF 106 in Singapore. Um, lots happened since that time. We presented, uh, I believe it was draft uh, three of uh, DFET individual draft sometime later uh, around the beginning of the following year. Got a call for adoption, actually got it adopted. We've had several drafts since. 
Uh, really, this was just an opportunity to, to say hello again to everyone in person and throw another photo up here of a nice IETF city. Uh, so <laughs> it's nice to be back. Uh, this is weird, but it's really nice to be back in front of everyone, see some faces um, inside and out the meetings. Uh, but since that time, give me the next slide. We've published a few things. So into the overview of Depop in general. Um, DPOP is this proof of possession mechanism. It's achieved by sending something we call a DPOP proof JWT is sent as an HTTP header. What this does is it demonstrates a reasonable level of proof of possession in the context of the given HTTP request. This header is sent the same way with mostly the same syntax and semantics on both requests to the token endpoint at the authorization server and on protected resource requests. The AS uses it to bind tokens that it issues to the, the public key contained in the proof, and the RS uses the proof um, to verify bound tokens. Um, just an example at, at the bottom there, it's just a jot, DPOP header and a jot, and fairly simple illustration of the token request includes the proof, bound tokens are issued. Following that, the bound tokens are used for resource access, sent in conjunction with the proof, and assuming that all validates, um, access is granted. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> this is strange. <laughs> um, the general anatomy of a DPROP proof, here's the jot exploded. They're explicitly typed because that's one of the best practices these days, uh, DPOP plus jot using that structured, um, structured suffix syntax. Um, we, the ALG, part of the, a normal jot there, we only, it only supports uh, asymmetric signatures, part of just the way that it works because these keys are sort of established almost like on a trust on first use basis. You present the key and proof that you control the, the associated private key. Um, so it only really works with asymmetric signatures. The actual key itself is included as a JWK header. Um, and this is the key both the, the signature over this jot will verify from and that including the content of the jot and the request is what proves possession of the associated private key. Um, we've got a JTI just for a unique identifier for following replay. Some minimal information about the HTTP request. This is what binds it to the request. It's not a, an integrity mechanism over the whole request or anything like that. It's a, it's a minimal amount of HTTP information that just associates this proof with that particular request or a subset of information about that request. Um, there's an IAT, an issue that time. And these proofs are then only accepted for a reasonable window around the IAT when receiving it. In um, 03, draft 03, we introduced a hash of the access token that's included there only on protected resource access. In draft 04, we introduced the server provided nonce. So if the server challenges with the nonce, the client has to follow up by including the nonce in a claim in the proof. Um, what did I miss? Something. I think we got it all there. Next slide, please. So an access token request when actually uh, requesting tokens, it's a normal request to the token endpoint at the authorization server, but a DPOP proof header is included in the request, uh, shown here in purple. It's just a jot as a header. Um, you'll see otherwise this is a normal authorization code um, request. Next, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> the access token response looks familiar. Um, Access token is issued, normal stuff here, refresh token. But the response types indicates that this access token has been DPOP bound by the inclusion of the DPOP value in the header. Um, for public clients, clients that don't have credentials associated with this authorization server, the refresh token is also bound to the, uh, the public key in the DPOP proof. Next slide. Uh, just following up with that, it looks the same. A refresh token request is the same kind of thing. A request to the token endpoint, normal refresh token stuff, but the DPOP proof um, header is also included here. The result of this would be, since this is a public client, there's no other uh, credentials, this refresh token was bound to that. So on checking this, the authorization server makes sure that the key in here matches the key to which this was bound, and then also subsequently issues new access tokens that are, that are in turn bound to this request, or bound to the public key in this uh, request. Next. And what an actual DPOP bound access <coughs> token looks like, either for JOT based access tokens or tokens uh, that are introspected, it's just the CNF claim. Um, and in turn, that includes 
uh, a SHA-256 hash of the JWK thumbprint of the public key that was in the proof. So basically it's binding this token to that public key through a hash of the public key included in the token uses in the CNF, the confirmation claim syntax uh, with a JKT for JSON web key thumbprint, I think was what it was short for. Tried to keep it relatively compact. Uh, next. <laughs> On protected resource requests, no surprise here. They look really similar as a normal request. It includes the access token with DPOP as the scheme and also includes DPOP uh, proof in the, in the header. Um, and what this allows is this token then is bound to the public key in here and part of the validation includes then validating the proof, signature accepted, and then in turn validating that the hash of the public key in the access token matches up to the hash in the, in, uh, excuse me, matches up to the public key in the proof itself. That was a bad explanation, but I hope you get the idea. Next. So for protected resource access, we have a 401 with a WA Authenticate challenge to indicate that DPOP is needed. In the case that there's a protected resource request without any token at all, uh, again, it, it can respond with a 401, and DPOP is the scheme. And here it can also indicate the algorithms it accepts for the proof itself. So these are the signature algorithms that are acceptable in the DPOP proof, so the types of algorithms that it can sign. And for uh, 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 requests, this is very similar to the bearer scheme, but a little bit information, additional information is necessary for like the signing algorithms. A response to a protected resource request with an invalid token for whatever reason. In this case, it was invalid because the confirmation didn't match the public key in the in the proof. So again, it's just a 401. Uh, the dub dub dub. Oh, there's something missing. <laughs> and that's how that got in the other spec. Yeah. <laughs> Copy paste. Anyway, there would be a bear, uh, 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 deep up here. What is the scheme and then the normal error parameters invalid token and error description just saying what's wrong, as well as the alg can be specified here as well. Um, and this is the algs in the, the challenge are the way that the resource server is able to signal what proof signing algorithms it, it accepts so that it can be a little bit more dynamic with the client. Next slide. Um, so in Draft four, we added the option for the server to provide a nonce um, that will, the option for a server provided nonce to be included in the DPROP proof, while drafts five and six hopefully refine and clarify this in a way that makes it really comprehensible and, and implementable. Some examples of how this works is the authorization server errors provides uh, this error code use DPOP nonce and the nonce itself is always included in a header of DPOP nonce. So basically this is just saying, uh, try again and include this nonce in that element of the proof when you send it. It's a little bit different on a protected resource challenge because we have the www authenticate um, in play there. And in that case, it's uh, the same error code, but delivered as a parameter on www authenticate. And the nonce though is again delivered in the header. So no matter where it is, the nonce comes back as a lone header. And that's useful, particularly in the case that you can provide a new nonce even for successful requests, which just tells the client on the next one, use this nonce. This allows a more efficient means of the server providing new nonces without constant back and forth of challenges. That just looks like this. Whatever it is, it's an okay, but a new nonce is provided. And so in the subsequent request, the client would use that nonce in its proof rather than whatever the last one it had was. So Brian, this is Roman. I'm, I'm sorry to kind of cut in from the uh, from the jabber. When you, it's really helpful for you to point to the screen, but you're not by the microphone, so some folks are having a hard time to hear. So either reach over if you could, or pull the mic out so you can travel. I was afraid you were going to say that because uh, I realized what I was doing right as you started talking. We'll do, especially since we're almost done. Thanks for the tip. Um, next slide. Uh, some metadata, uh, the authorization server. So we talked a little bit about how the resource server can signal the algor proof algorithms that it supports. 
The authorization server can provide the algorithms it supports through the use of metadata. It's just one new uh, metadata um, parameter, DPOP, signing alg value supported. And this just signals support for DPOP in general at the AS uh, by its presence, as well as the particular algorithms that it supports. It's an array of strings. In drafts five and six, we added uh, client registration metadata, both for client registration and for the general sort of model of client metadata is useful as a, as a way of sort of providing a common data model for clients in general. We added DPOP bound access tokens, and it's just a Boolean value that indicates whether this client will always use DPOP or not when requesting tokens from the authorization server. This felt like a fairly common switch that might be needed to enforce particular policy around one client. So say this client is always gonna use DPOP. If it doesn't, something's wrong and reject it. Next slide, please. Thank you, Rafat. Uh -huh. So binding an authorization code to a DPOP key in draft 05, which is relatively recent, the optional DPOP JKT authorization request parameter was added. This is a parameter on the authorization request. It's the SHA-256 JBUK thumbprint of the proof of possession key of the DPOP key. This comes in in the authorization request. The AS binds the authorization code it issues as a result of that request after the whole dance to that thumbprint. And then on code redemption, it checks that thumbprint against the DPOP proof provided in the token request, otherwise rejects it. This enables a, a more end-to-end -end binding of the whole authorization flow to a particular DPOP key that was lacking in prior versions. It can be used in conjunction with Pixie with no changes required to Pixie. And when using PAR, you have that initial pushed authorization request that provides the opportunity to bind early. So when you're using PAR, you can bind either from the DPOP proof presented in the PAR request itself, the normal header, presented in the, header, or, uh, in the request, or can also bind using the same parameter, DPOP JKT. If they're both provided, they need to be the same. Uh, quick example of what that looks like, no scary surprise, but it's just an additional header in a GET request that would be sent through the browser, it includes the thumbprint of the key uh, by that parameter name. Next slide, please. So, looking ahead, um, next steps, IETF, 114 is scheduled to be in Philadelphia. Uh, we'll see if that happens or not, but uh, a couple of things that are kind of open right now that I'm aware of. One is whether or not the application DPOP JKT uh, media type registration is really necessary. This is the pattern that's been followed by a number of, uh, of other documents. But as I look at it, we're, it feels like a bit overkill to actually go out and register a whole new media type for this one type of jot that's only ever gonna be sent in an HTTP header. Um, so there's some words in there that kind of ask that question. No one's actually answered them. Registering, it's not a big deal. We can put it in there, but it just seems really excessive. Um, so I don't know if some higher ups, chairs or ADs have some advice along those lines. Uh, I would certainly be interested in hearing it. We also have six authors on the document, which according to the RFC Skiled Guide is considered excessive. Uh, and Gritty's down here. Um, helping me with that statement. So those are two sort of administrative problems that, that I think need to be fixed for sure, but they are basically just minor administrative issues. So that in terms of the protocol definition and functionality itself, I feel like we're approaching a place where working group last call is a reasonable thing to start considering. Um, so I'll put that out there. Are we closing in on uh, working, working group last call? Um, and yes, that is Philadelphia. And Gritty's from Philadelphia. I thought Roman was trying to join the, um, yeah, uh, Mike, if you can join the, the queue, please. Roman, uh, Yeah, I was did just you... jumping in to help with some of the administrative things. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, so jumping in on the middle one is six authors excessive per the style guide. Yes, that is the letter of the law of the style guide. Uh, if the working group really feels that it's important to to have all of those authors, I will support them in that. We just need to document that appropriately in the Shepherd write-up, and I will carry and support the working group in that decision through the ISG. Oh, do you think that's possible, Roman? the The style guide Absolutely. was was very um, harsh about it, so I was assuming we would need to cut down. But if you think it's something we can push through with a little bit of explanation, that would be great. Yeah, I mean. 
we could talk about this offline, but it's my understanding that all the authors there have very much kind of contributed there, and there's a, a very tight story as to why we why we have that list, and that seems important to the working group, unless someone kind of disagrees with me. So I will help through the process to make sure that the, the document stays as it is with that author list. Wonderful, thank you. Mike, <laughs> did you join the, the queue? <laughs> I, I did. You can see it on the yellow screen Good. there. Good. It's a beautiful thing. Nice. Um, this is Mike Jones from Microsoft. Um, my memory of the description of the JOT type claim is that those are intended to be media types with a special syntax addition that you're allowed to leave off application slash. But per my earlier statement, those are supposed to be media types. Media types are things registered in the IANA media type registry. Therefore, I think we should just register it, even if it's never used as a media type per se, that field is for media types. Your memory, I believe, is correct. I think that's right. Uh, it's just every time I sit down to do it, it seems kind of crazy. But maybe we should just go ahead. There's also a structured suffix for plus JWT registered. Um, but I suppose that it's, I wanted to think about that sort of as like a, a wild card for, you could just go ahead and use this as a media type. But it sounds like, from what you're saying, we should just go ahead and bite the bullet and do the registration. Right, the structured suffix was registered by a different RFC and is already in the IANA registries. And I couldn't remember whether we've done the registration or not. If we have not, I will create a pull request while we sit here if I get bored. We have not done it. There's some, some rambling words to the effect of what I just said in okay, the area okay. where it would be, so. PR pending. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, Sohas? Is my audio coming through? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can. Hi. Um, I, I uh, on the registration, I would say we should go ahead and do it. On the working group last call, uh, I would support uh, to go go to the last call. Uh, uh, within Cisco, uh, we are planning to use uh, this uh, kind of this this solution for WebEx uh, in order to mit mitigate uh, theft risk for the tokens we use for internal services. And we've been following this graph pretty closely, and the refinements uh, in the five and six and overall has been uh, at the point where the returns are diminishing. diminishing. Um, I think this is good enough. I, I, we think we should uh, go ahead with the last, last call for this draft. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Put your hand down, Mike. Yeah. Okay, so um, do you wanna maybe then kind of update the, the document based on that discussion with Mike, and, and then we can probably start our group last call. Yeah, that okay. sounds good. Okay, awesome. Anything else? Perfect, thank you. Thank you, thank you all. There you go. You can, just, me you can choose this. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah, you don't have to. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Okay, let's get going. So I'm going to be talking about three direction attacks. Next slide, please. So this, uh, um, um, there was an article that prompted the whole discussion here. Uh, the, the article was talking about uh, some uh, specific vendors uh, and, and issues around implementation of, uh, of redirections. Uh, just to be clear, th those um, problems and issues that we will discuss right now, not specific for those vendors. It's just much, much wider than that. So next slide, please. Um, so let's talk about that, how the whole thing starts with the attacker setup. 
um, initially the, the attacker uh, creates an account on the victim's platform, um, creates an application on that platform, uh, and uh, crafts an authorization request with the goal of redirecting that user to an application that controls by controlled by, by the attacker, uh, and then send that request to uh, the victim through SMS or email or whatever. Right? Next slide, please. In fact, uh, yep. also take the microphone and put it in the hand. Oh, yeah, you're maybe. doing the same. Is that better? Can you hear me better? That's good. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a, a typical uh, authorization request. You have a, a, the get request with a, a response type, a redirect URI, a scope, and a client ID. Um, and obviously, the host that hosts that uh, endpoint. Uh, we're showing a, a host name that um, is uh, shared between all tenants. Some other deployments will show the tenant itself also in the URL. The issues applicable to either deployment, right? Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about um, what the RFC is talking about today, like what's how to handle uh, those error cases. So the first part is talking about a um, redirection URI, if there is a problem with redirection URI or a client identifier, then the authorization server should inform the resource owner and must not automatically redirect the user, right? Which is good. That's what, what we want, right? The second part is that it says if the resource owner denies that request or if the, the request fails for any other reason, then the Authorization server informs the client by adding some other parameters and redirecting the user, right? So that's the, the RFC today. Um, and, and notice that it says authorization server informs the client. It doesn't say must, should. It's, it's, uh, that's the way it is today. So ne next slide. So we will talk about four different uh, issues that, that, that were discussed. Oh, actually, I can look at it here. <laughs> Uh, uh, the first one is um, um, if there is a problem with that request, uh, there is a, an invalid response type or a scope. So uh, after the user authenticates, and if there is a, one, one of those parameters are invalid, uh, and, the, and the client ID and the uh, redirect to RIs are controlled by the attacker, then the user will be uh, redirected to that specific website controlled by, by that attacker. So that's the, the, the first use case. Next, please. So the second one is after the user authenticates, typically you will get the consent. And you'll have to either confirm or decline. So in this case, it doesn't matter what you do, whether you accept it or decline it, you'll still be the, redirected to, to that uh, attacker uh, controlled uh, um, uh, application. Next slide, please. Uh, this issue is talking about even redirection even before the authentication. So this is an example of a, 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 a crafted um, a message. Um, it's just the only thing that there is is a client ID. Every other parameter is missing, and the, and the user redirected automatically to a specific uh, application. Next one. Okay, so this one is the, the most challenging, challenging issue probably that, that we'll face here. So this is um, around silence, uh, silent authentication. And this is an OIDC uh, kind of spe specification which, which allows, um, um, allows that, that allow you to check if um, a user is still authenticated or the consent is still valid without really prompting the user, right? And again, in this case, the user will be redirected to um, that um, uh, application controlled by, by the, the, uh, the attacker. Next slide. So the question is, do we need uh, a rethinking here around uh, how to handle um, error, uh, error, error handling, right? So do we want to say, hey, the server should always be responsible for handling those error cases? Should there be an explicit text about you have first to authenticate the user before 
attempting to redirect the user, how to handle solid authentication, which is probably the, the most challenging part of this story, how to handle the, the declined uh, consent um, use case. Regardless of what, what we do, I think we at least want to document all of this and explain, uh, like, uh, try to improve the current situation, and we could do that. And there are a few options here about documenting the, the status. Either update the, the current security BCP, which is we're trying to ship soon, but we'll see if, if that's the right path. If not, maybe, maybe a, a, a new dedicated document just to talk about this, uh, those issues that we've, we, we've seen in the field, right? So what I'm looking for here is that really thought, discussions, and see what, what should be done here. So uh, that's, that's my last slide. And um, looking for people to line up and have some discussion here. Any thoughts? Know if I, I didn't know if I should just like talk through meet echo or since we're in the room or what no, no. Yeah, it was, yeah. that was a joke that was fine anyway <laughs> um, so uh, everything you're describing here is kind of like this is the known trade-off uh, the well-known trade-off of doing anything in the front channel yep. um, you know it's kind of an inherently fishable space and um, you know the the documents especially uh, you know, the updated BCPs and stuff like that do a pretty good job of describing that. Not going into exactly the specificity of these particular attacks, I agree. Um, so to me, I, I realize that we're trying to ship as much as fast as we can, um, adding a few additional paragraphs to the BCP to describe the specifics of these attacks. To me, that makes the most sense. I don't think that this makes sense as its own document, just talking about one little description thing. If that's what you're gonna do, you may as well write it in a blog post and call it a day because right. more people would actually read it there. And um, I don't think that this really needs to hold up the BCP because I don't think that this, this is really a new attack. This is really just a description of how bad this attack surface really is that we've all already know about right. with just more specifics. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Mike. Uh, Mike Jones, Microsoft. <clears throat> uh, Justin, I like char your characterization of adding descriptions of things we already know. I think that is an appropriate kind of response to the thinking that the working group has done around this, and it's good thinking. Yeah. Um, I do not think we should be proposing normative changes to any of our specifications. I think we should be, in particular, asking authorization server and OpenID provider implementers to think about the security implications of doing the redirect back under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd be glad to review such a text, and I bet Justin would too. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Daniel? Yeah, um, I agree that this is probably, so the security BCP is probably the right place for this. Mm -hmm. um, but probably the next version of the security BCP. So I think at some point we agreed that uh, we don't want to add any future text to the security BCP. But we're not, we're not, like, we're still reviewing the document. Like, why do you want to wait for a new version of BCP? Like, because I think it usually um, entails a lot of discussion um, and probably delay in the already quite late document. So, I, I think as, as Justin mentioned, like, we, these are well known things, right? It's, it's nothing, nothing really new if we just, capture this, just make sure implementers understand this. It's yeah, I, right. just waiting for a completely new BCP. It's, it's uh, I mean, if we can really quickly agree on a text to add, then it would probably be fine, but we shouldn't be waiting with the BCP for this change. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Daniel. Anybody else? Any comments? Go ahead, Dave, Mike. Mike Jones, Microsoft. Speaking to Daniel's remark, um, we still have to go through ITF review. We yep. still have to go through IASG review. There's a lot of opportunity to add a couple paragraphs. Uh, prudently, I think those who care should find a room, write two paragraphs, and leave this week with mission accomplished. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have those side meetings too, right? We can we can see if we can discuss those during that time. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Thank you all. That that was that was good feedback. Appreciate it. Okay. Aaron. Apparently, I'm the shortest one here. <laughs> OK. Um, hi, Aaron Paraki from Okta. Um, yes. Slides there. I don't get a clicker, right? No, no, yeah. No. OK. Just, just look at this there. Fantastic. Well, you... So uh, thank you. I'm going to give an update on OAuth 2.1 and talk about um, some of the things that have changed since the last time we've talked about it, some of the plan changes, and then I have identified a couple of issues to um, discuss either here, since apparently we have quite a lot of time left, or during the side meetings uh, for more faster paced discussion if needed. So um, since last time we met, which was virtually in I believe October or November or so, uh, we've gone, we've, we identified some things there and have done many of those updates. So uh, thanks to several people who have contributed to the document to help make all that possible. Um, the TLS has, is now mandatory for redirect URLs except for loopback interfaces. So that was a nice update to see. We've talked about that before. Hopefully not a surprise. Um, there was a big reorg uh, in the language used to talk about TLS because it was scattered through many different parts referencing, kept referencing that TLS was like a good idea and a new thing that maybe we should do. And um, <laughs> so that's all now consolidated and it's kind of just assumed uh, right at the beginning and then instead of repeated all the way throughout. Um, there's been a lot more editorial clarification, clarifications um, based on Vittorio and Justin's extensive feedback as well as some uh, additional pull requests that were submitted by other people in the community, so that's wonderful. Um, another big reorg that happened is, or is ongoing, it's not finished yet. We've been pulling out from the security considerations, it turns out there was a lot of things in there that was actually normative. And that's not really a good place for normative text, so we've been pulling that into the appropriate spot in the main document. Uh, and that counts both text from the security considerations of 6749 as well as other drafts that were extensions. So that's hopefully easier to see now as well. Uh, the, another change was the refresh token guidance, so that now matches the security BCP, which has had already updated its guidance previously, so we're trying to keep that in sync, and I guess that's going to go for the discussion we'll have this week as well about these uh, redirection issues, so we'll have to roll that up too. Um, I, do, I do think that it makes the most sense to uh, essentially wait on the security BCP until that's pr more or less final and anything that goes into that gets pull pulled into 2.1. Um, and then a uh, there is a new section which is now in there which explicitly mentions the implicit flow because there had previously been no reference to it at all. There's a new section in there talking specifically about it uh, explicitly in relation to OpenID Connect. It is uh, essentially saying that the implicit flow the, the OAuth issuing tokens from the authorization endpoint is what is being removed from the spec rather than 
something called the implicit flow. And uh, that leaves the room open for OpenID Connect to still define the response type ID token, which is a form of an implicit flow in OpenID Connect. So hopefully that is now clear for people who are wondering why is there no implicit flow. It's because specifically it's the OAuth one that we don't want. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is a lot of work. There's still more to do. And uh, I have been going through Vittorio and Justin's feedback, have made it through about sections, uh, partway through section eight now. We're getting into nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So there's still a few more sections left. Um, some of that has started, some of that is still remaining. And uh, that is, hopefully we'll get through that. Um, there's still more normative text in the security considerations, which still needs to get pulled in, in line. Again, I've just been sort of doing that slowly uh, as I've been going through the doc. Um, there's the issue we identified at the last meeting, which is expanding the, uh, there's a section in there called differences from OAuth 2. And uh, as we discussed at the last session, we intend to be more explicit about the changes that are causing certain roles to do things differently and documenting exactly what is breaking for who. Uh, since a lot of the later extensions do modify behavior of uh, compared to 6749 by itself. Uh, there are a handful of open issues. That is the link to them. So please uh, go there and read them. Essentially what I've been doing is as I've been going through the reviews from uh, mainly from Justin Vittorio, um, I have been making a lot of the suggested changes that are relatively straightforward and what I believe are not controversial at all. Mostly it's been editorial stuff. Anytime there's been something in there that is something that is there is not a clear resolution to, uh, I've been pulling it out as an issue so that we can actually um, track it better and and make sure we get around to talking about it. So there, there are a handful of those in the GitHub right now, which we still need to process. Um, some of that can happen here in the room. Some of that can happen during the side sessions. Some of it is probably better for the mailing list so or the GitHub thread. Um, so please feel free to jump in on those. Uh, next slide. So uh, for the... I guess I should I guess I should pause since what I have left for this is a couple of I think it's three issues I identified as things that would probably be a good good issues to talk about in a larger setting synchronously now um, but before I go and describe those and actually get dig into this do we have any comments or questions about the progress so far Hey, Aaron. Uh, Justin Richer. Uh, first off, great work. It is no small task pulling all of this text together and making it make sense. Um, uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, if we could go back a slide, I just wanted to uh, bring to light a very, very important point here on number 97 that, uh, that might have been elided a little bit. And that's that uh, the notion of what is backwards compatibility um, in the tech in the in the context of OAuth 2.1 is going to vary depending on whether you're talking about compatible for a client for an AS whether you've got a 2.0 client talking to a 2.0 AS or to a 2.1 AS or vice versa or something like that and so I'm I'm very very glad that that is a focus that is also something I'm going to I, I wanted to point this out so that when people are reviewing this text, especially the bits that say, don't do this thing anymore, keep in mind what that means to all of the different parties in the ecosystem, because there are some types of breaking backwards compatibility that we're actually okay with, because certain combinations of those versions were okay with that actually not working anymore. Okay, um, then let's go ahead and move on to number five. Yes. So um, at the last meeting, we had brought up this issue, which is um, this new mechanism, the ISS response parameter. Um, that was a fledgling idea at the time. 
And the consensus at the time during the last session was let's not touch it until it's reached RFC status because we're supposed to be rolling up best practices. Surprise, it is now an RFC as of like three days ago, I think. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> congrats. Um, so now we have to have the discussion again. So the idea with this is it is a um, security fix for clients that talk to multiple authorization servers. It is a pretty straightforward mechanism, which is, a, I believe, why it, it breezed right through the whole process and moved through pretty quickly. Um, it, and it only applies to clients that talk to multiple ASs. So if you are only talking to one AS, then you can pretty much ignore this draft completely and don't worry about it. Uh, so the question now is, now that it is an RFC, is it considered best practice? And if so, do we bring it into 2.1 or at the very least reference it from 2.1 as either a requirement or a possibility or um, et cetera, et cetera. There are now these, these questions to have. So um, that is the first, first issue. Um, any thoughts from the room? Mike Jones, Microsoft. Um, out of fairness, I was one of the people who said, wait, um, it's now an RFC. I'm fine <clears throat> folding in guidance, at least, saying if you're going to talk to multiple authorization servers, do yourself a favor and present the, prevent the mix-up attack. Great. And I'd be glad to review text. Um, so along those lines, is it a better idea to incorporate the text of the RFC into 2.1 or in the appropriate place, reference out to it saying, here are some conditions, go read the mechanism over there? As a sometimes editor, I'll say, include an example of using it in the normative text, but I'd be fine referencing it rather than pulling it all in. I realize there's a tension but because you're, you and the co-authors are correctly trying to create something that's more readable. And I've gotten some additional feedback that it is more readable. So, you know, good for you and good for us. Uh, but it's a judgment call. Okay. Um, Any, anyone else? Anybody else? Okay. Don't you, don't in the queue you don't care, Daniel? <laughs> I'm not in the queue because I'm. Now yeah, I am. There you go. Okay. You can't figure it out. Okay. So, Daniel here from yes.com. Um, yeah, so I would um, also support what Mike said, so um, including very brief guidance uh, that you should do that and. Um, Maybe also the like the most common case, which is pretty easy, right? You at the issue there. Um, but in the RFC, we also have um, some guidance around what you do when you don't um, have this idea of an issuer in your OAuth um, deployment and so on. So there's 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 a lot more guidance around some corner cases there, or like combination with JAM or something like that. Um, so therefore, it would probably make sense to, to describe the common case and then refer to the RFC for the other cases. Okay, I'm happy with that. Um, for my own sake later, did that get captured in the notes? Hold on, Brian. Brian has a comment. Ah, yeah. okay. Yes. I've actually sort of more of a question, uh, Brian Campbell from Ping Identity. Um, as you mentioned, it's, it doesn't apply to most clients that are just talking to one AS, but the actual mechanism of doing it is something the AS has to do. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I was maybe wondering if you could clarify or start thinking about how you portray that in a document like this where you 
it's the optionality is sort of conditioned on something the client's doing, whereas the AS is the one that has to support it or not, or at least be on that side of it. Do you, how are you going to resolve that? That is a very good point. Um, it seems like probably the right way to handle it is to describe the situation as if your AS is likely to be used by clients that will support other ASs, then, then you need to do this. Uh, because you're right, it is something that the AS has to build support for in order for yeah. in order for a client to use it. Okay. But I, I also think that's actually pretty realistic because I think realistically, um, or actually, sorry, there's another condition or another call out in the ISS draft, which is using separate redirect URIs per client. Is that correct? Or per AS? Client can use multiple redirect URIs per AS. Not, not a recommendation, but it does solve the problem. Well, that's in, in the mic. Microphone. Mike, Mike. Yeah, Daniel here. Um, if I remember correctly, we mentioned that this could be used in theory, but um, this, I'm not sure if we even discussed this in detail in the RFC. It's in a security BCP. There's an example. So mm. there's, there's more discussion on... Uh, why you could use that to defend against mix-up attacks, um, but also why it's maybe not a good idea. So there's some some subtle details there that you need to take care of. Okay, uh, so sorry, that was... So the ISS uh, parameter is really the only thing that I would consider a robust defense against mix-up attacks. Sure, sorry, it was a little bit of a tangent. I was just thinking, in, realistically, deployments are going to likely either, like, they tend to work as a whole. There there's, tends to be NAS that someone is going to be using and then a bunch of clients. So I think realistically it's not really a problem uh, in, in saying the sort of like if your AS is likely to be one of many that a client works with in practice, then that's, I, I, I think it will cover it realistically. Uh, Mike, again, uh, just thinking out loud, I would eventually get to this anyway. Um, the ISS parameter was kind of motivated by the OpenID Connect issuer in the first place. And it's one of these cases, if you're doing pure OAuth and you're not doing Connect, all of this applies. If you're already doing Connect, you already have an issuer. And so the parameter would be duplicative. I'm not looking to make special cases, but I'm also not looking to add stuff that you already have. Uh, Mike, can you repeat that? If you're doing pure OAuth and not OpenID Connect, what is the... It, if you're doing pure OAuth, you don't have an issuer without this parameter. Whereas if what you're doing is always OpenID Connect and not pure OAuth, or... or you know, Open ID Connect on top of OAuth 2, you always already have an issuer in the ID token. In the ID token, so there's no need to also include it in the response. I believe that's mentioned in the draft as well, right? Yeah, getting nods. Okay, could be. Yeah. I'm just talking out loud yeah. about where this is really needed and where it isn't. This is all definitely making me think it's much better plan to mention some simple examples and reference out for the details since the draft mentions all the details. All good. Yeah. Great. Vittorio Bertocci, Octa. First time I say <laughs> First Octa. First time. I am a, I'm a very excited. Uh, I seem to remember that uh, part of the discussion was that uh, um, you want to have an issuer in the request without having to dig inside the ID token. And there was some reason for that, because like, uh, there are situations in which the ID token might, it might, you might have to wait until you decrypt it. And instead, having the issuer in the request, even in the case of uh, OpenID, was useful. Because then you were able, for example, to know what key you need to use for um, actually going inside the ID token. I don't remember the details, but I remember the part that uh, there was a specifically a desire to have these in the request without the ID token. Just wanted to modify what uh, Mike said. Maybe encryption 
then if that, um, so you mentioned that in pure auth, there's no issue, um, right? But I'm also, that's probably a separate topic, but I'm also strongly advocating for always having metadata in auth 2.1, which would mean that you would also have an issuer. So that might uh, make things easier again, because you can rely on that issuer. So maybe some corner cases that are discussed in the RFC are not relevant. Just saying. Got it, yeah. Um, Philip Skokan, Okta. Um, echoing Vittorio's comment about asking to have the ISS in the response, um, one of the reasons to use that before relying on OpenID Connect is that it is actually available in the response. I don't have to make the code call um, to get my ID token because even that code call, if I make it, it's part of the mix-up attack surface. Yep. Okay, well, it sounds like, yeah, sounds like we more or less agree on that, so I will work on that and report back. So, yes, next. next. Uh, okay, number 101 on GitHub. Um, this is something I discovered as I was reading through the text I was copying and editing. Um, technically, RFC 6750 requires, but it's in the security considerations section, that access tokens must have a limited lifetime. That is uh, not ambiguous. However, I know for a fact that many deployments do not expire access tokens for various reasons, which means they're technically not following OAuth 2.0 right now. So this is uh, the reality today. And the question is, what do we do to reconcile that? Because it seems kind of weird to publish a new document that is going to even more clearly state that this is not allowed. Because essentially what I, the reason I found this was I was going through the security considerations, pulling out normative text in line into the higher up in the docs so people actually read it. And this is one of those things, which I think people didn't read and then have just ignored because it was in security considerations. So maybe the question is, um, was this in security, con security considerations because it was not intended to be a real must? <laughs> <laughs> or is this, was this always intended to be a real must and people have just ignored it, which means maybe we should just not enforce it because people ignored it anyway. So I don't know what to do here. Thoughts are welcome. So as the primary editor of 6750, Mike Jones speaking, I'll say that I inherited a bunch of text from another Aaron and I, did with it what seemed best at the time, but I remember no intent to have a normative must even be in security considerations. In fact, stuff I've edited since that, I've tried to avoid ever doing that, but the IESG didn't call me out on it. So take that for what you will, but there's nothing conscious about this. <clears throat> Justin Richer, um, it, to me, this really, uh, like the paragraph is still decent advice and it should be phrased as advice. If you have bearer tokens, which is what this whole section is about, then it's a good idea to not have them live forever. And um, that can be reasonably interpreted in a number of ways. Um, including having a time-based expiration, but also, as you mentioned down at the bottom, lifetime doesn't need to necessarily mean that it's time-based. Uh, like, you know, you can expire based on an, or you can be revoked based on an event, or on suspicion, or on client deregistration, or any number of other things. Th that's not clear from this text, and so I agree in expanding that. I don't think that this should have any normative weight at all though because this is this is security advice about you know this is a thing about bearer tokens and one way to to limit the attack surface is to limit the lifetime 
And so I say get rid of this. Don't, don't call it a must or a should or anything. This is just contextual advice for how to deal with some of the inherent problems of bearer tokens. George. Wow, will it work? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Wow, kind of fun. Um, I, I guess the thing, you know, a little bit to Dustin's point that I'm sort of struggling with here is half of what we're trying to do in OAuth 2.1 is remove things that are security, you know, bad practice, right? I mean, otherwise we could say put, don't use implicit flow in the security considerations and leave it there. So if we think that um, allowing forever access tokens is a bad idea, then it seems relevant to me that we put some normative language around that in the, the text. I mean, as Justin pointed out, it does, you know, you could limit it to end uses or any number of other things. Um, it doesn't have to be time-based, but I worry about just leaving it open and allowing, you know, bad practice to continue. Go ahead, Justin. Oh, Justin Richer. Uh, just to Vittorio, I think you were in. Yeah, that, okay, that's whatever. fine. Fine. Uh, I was just going to say, if this does remain a normative requirement, I guarantee that I am not going to follow it um, because I have active. I, 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 Mike says that I am a bad person. That's irrelevant to this part of the conversation. <laughs> um, no, so uh, I have a number of um, sort of, you know, larger system use cases where access tokens are taking the place of what we would have traditionally called API keys, right? We're not issuing them in the same type of, you know, OAuth going to a client type of thing, but from the 6750 perspective, they are OAuth tokens and they're being configured in software. And those get rotated when software gets redeployed or somebody just needs to, you know, rebump their configuration or something like that, but they're not being requested in the sort of dynamic fashion that we normally think of. We're okay with this because of the way that we have a very sort of very, very limited space in which these tokens get, uh, that get issued. They're not issued using 6749 tooling at all, right? And so that's a case where we looked at this and we actually decided to implement these quote unquote forever access tokens for use in this system because within our security model, it actually makes sense for that very, very limited case. So that's, that's one of the reasons why, to me, this needs to be contextual advice and not a normative requirement. I absolutely understand where George is coming from. Um, this should be giving all of the best advice, and that is good default advice. Um, but you should be able to read and understand that and say, I'm pretty sure I know why this doesn't apply. That's fair. I may also say that if you are not using any of the 6749 tooling to get the access token, then really it is an API key, not a no auth bearer token, in which case, NA. Uh, I largely agree, Vittorio Octa. I largely agree with the uh, spirit that has been uh, expressed so far. I think that the intent there is good but the way in which it's expressed is uh, anachronistic and a bit simplistic. Uh, in today's world, in which it's fashionable to do continuous authentication, as long as you are on top of a reason for which uh, you are still okay with that particular token, that token can technically live forever. Let's say that, uh, again, I don't want to use uh, fashionable stuff like zero trust and similar, but if you are using uh, introspection, for example, or any other mechanism in which you can deal with uh, revocation of tokens when circumstances allow or circumstances suggest that it's time to do it, as long as those circumstances never arise and you are still okay with the security posture of uh, the caller, that stuff technically can live forever. I do agree with George that uh, I think that, it, well, I don't know if uh, we can have a normative text uh, because of the nature of what I just described. It, uh, it might be difficult to describe in formal terms uh, 
what that means. But I do think that uh, we need to help people understand that they do need to do the work, that they shouldn't just like uh, do a fire and forget, like uh, here is a token, use it forever. It's more of uh, make sure that you have uh, sensible criteria to decide whether this thing should still be allowed to operate or if instead circumstances have changed. But I do agree that that sentence is just not applicable in uh, a variety of scenarios like the one that uh, Justin just mentioned. It sounds like what you're saying is the AS must have a way to revoke a token if it wants to oh, under its own criteria. That was uh, one example of uh, a token that lives forever because somehow uh, like you don't know what you, maybe the user has done something that uh, suggests that the circumstances are still, yeah, I'm still trusting this thing. But uh, it's just one example, like the, the example that Justin brought up is different, but sure, just I'm... as valid. So that's why I'm saying it's going to be difficult to find a normative language that will uh, encompass all of this stuff. Well, I was, I was trying to find something normative that is also l least, less specific to particular cases. So that like what you're asking for is don't, don't hard code these keys such that they're just hard coded everywhere. Like make sure that you're building a way to revoke them. But the particular reason for revocation is not something we can normatively require, like say. Or the so, mechanism that you use to yeah. perform yeah. that thing is kind of like, maybe we can enumerate a couple to give people ideas, but we can't enforce any. Like for example, introspection is a good way of saying uh, you must call home, or if you don't want to do introspection, but you want to have, I don't know, uh, um, allow lists or block lists uh, for uh, your uh, the revoked tokens. Like ultimately, I don't feel that we can be in a position of imposing to people what's best for their architecture. It's more of a matter of like, uh, make sure that you don't paint yourself in a corner and give tokens that uh, once out, they are out of your control and they can be used forever. Seeing some nodding from George, okay. okay. George? Yeah, so I, I think I agree with that. my biggest concern is sort of what you stumbled across, Aaron, which is this is in the security considerations and probably nobody read it. So I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hearing the, the difficulty of coming up with normative text to sort of imply the correct security behavior. But somehow I think we have to make it more clear in the default section of 2.1 here are all these, you know, here's some examples. Effectively, you need to protect the access tokens, as Vittorio just said. And here's some, you know, different ways that you can do that, right? That isn't, you know, just a reference to go read the section in the security considerations um, so that we hopefully do a little bit better education, even if it's non-normative. Okay. Peter? Uh, Peter Kasselman, uh, Microsoft. Uh, so. I, I don't have a particular problem with this idea that the lifetime of the token must be limited. I, th I actually think it's good because if you don't have the notion of an end state, you have no way to get there. So to Vittorio's point, uh, by defining an end state, you have to define mechanisms to get there, right? So it's revocation mechanisms, it's events, uh, it may, may be expiration times, right? There may be a number of those ways. You may want to consider giving guidance on what limited means, right? So that could be uh, defined or enacted in a number of ways. Uh, but I think if you omit it, forever is an incredibly long time, right? And, and often doesn't last more than, say, a year or five years or something like that, right? So, um, so I think I actually don't have a problem with that statement. It's more about how you define limited and giving guidance to the implementers around how they construct policies but having the ability to revoke um, in case something goes wrong. If you don't have that, you're gonna find yourself in a really nasty place. Okay, that's it, I guess. You good? Yeah, okay, I think, I think, that's, I think that's enough on that. Um, that was helpful. I will add that to my list and get back to uh, report back on the mailing list, I guess. Awesome, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we have one more. Ah, yes. Uh, this was identified um, 
opened as an issue on GitHub, so this may be the first time people are aware of this. Um, the From the native apps BCP, which has now been pulled into uh, OAuth 2.1, it actually has a requirement that authorization servers that support the native apps BCP all support, support all three of these redirect URI methods for native apps, which is private URI schemes, so that's claiming a, a, or defining your own URI scheme, and it gives some examples of ideally using like reverse DNS-based ones, but that's not a requirement either. Um, claiming HTTPS URLs, which is a feature that iOS and Android platforms support, and also the loopback interface of just opening up a port on the device, and authorization servers must offer at least these three. Uh, and then it was pointed out that there are many times that a, for a particular deployment, uh, you actually don't want to allow any one of these in particular uh, for various reasons. For example, FAPI actually goes and prohibits, prohibits uh, private URL, URI schemes because they're not nearly as secure as registered HTTPS URLs. So technically, if you follow FAPI, you also are not following the native apps BCP. So that is the current, that is currently the, the way that it is written. Um, so now that this gets brought into OAuth 2.1, it seems a little bit weird again to say that if you're following FAPI's rules, which are meant to be more secure, that you're then also not able to follow 2.1. So again, we have the sort of conflict that needs to get reconciled somehow. Daniel? Daniel, fetyes.com. Um, I'm not sure if there's actually conflict there because it hinges on whether you want to support native apps at all. Um, and I know a couple of deployments that don't intend, so that intentionally don't support native apps. Uh, I think the same applies to FAPI. So um, one could say that if you want to support native apps, then you have to offer um, some of these options at least. But you can also just say not to support native apps. <coughs> What, but, but, but FAPI, native apps can also use FAPI. So right. yeah. that's so, where the conflict happens. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the exact wording is in FAPI right now, but um, yeah. So probably it's a good idea to leave the door open for not supporting this. I know for sure that there are customers that want to get caught dead supporting the loopback interface. So having a mask that includes that thing will automatically mean that those people will be out of compliance. So I'm strongly in favor on not having a mask in there. If we could get rid of a loopback, that would be fantastic, but I know it would be too good. So at the very least, I would not force people to implement it if they want to do a native client. Brian? I'm not sure what I was going to say now. I, Get close I to the mic. Okay. I don't think there's necessary. It's not uncommon for profiles like FAPI or otherwise to further narrow what's allowed based on other things. Um, I mean, for example, FAPI disallows um, client secret authentication. Um, which is required by the base. So I don't know that there's inherently a contradiction. Uh, that said, though, I, I think the way that this text is being pulled from a BCP about a very narrow context and over, it would probably be better to somehow qualify it with not must or under the conditions that you're supporting native apps, you should do these things. It, yeah. So it's both, it's both okay, and I think you should change it. <laughs> Great. If that makes, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, Dave Tong, uh, Money Hub. Um, yeah, and I, I kind of agree with what Brian's saying. I definitely think the wording needs to be changed. I mean, if I understand compliance, uh, you know, it's only if I fully support native apps, I need to offer all three. So maybe if I want to support not fully native apps, I could only support two. So I think it definitely needs the wording is a bit strange. I also, I think it's highly unlikely that any authorization servers 
you know, many of them will just not be compliant with the security BCP, because I don't, I don't think that's the intention, surely. It, it must be that these are three different ways of doing it, which you could support. To it, it, so, yeah, that, that would just be my suggestion. And I, but also, if we're trying to make things more secure, um, unless there are, is a good reason to support the, the pri uh, private URI scheme, then maybe that, that should be excluded because, you know, the reason we excluded in FAPI was because of, you know, the fact that in, you know, many of the mobile systems, you know, different apps could claim the same private URI scheme. So, I mean, my, the starting point, I would say, is to remove that unless there's a good reason to keep it in. Yeah, that's another option is to, to require claimed URL schemes and loopback and make the private URI scheme optional, just mention that it's a possibility, um, or just not require not require any of them. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious what the reason actually was for the requirement of offering all three of them in the first place, and I kind of suspect it was a optimistic attempt at interoperability, which kind of seems like maybe that wasn't the right goal for that feature. George? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I think I'm in favor of not <clears throat> explicitly forcing authorization servers to support all these mechanisms. And I am in favor, <clears throat> sorry, um, I am in favor of ordering them by best security practices, right? So we should be telling people use the claimed HTTPS, HTTPS URLs, um, Right, and, and unless you have a really good reason to do something else, just don't, right? Um, you know, if you have to support some, you know, legacy version of OS that maybe doesn't support it or whatever, well then, you know, maybe you have to, right? And you have a really good reason for it. But otherwise, I think we should be pushing people toward the secure options, which at this point is, you know, claim HTTPS URLs, um, and, you know, whether we want to put other, you know, guidance in here around other ways, you know, that the OSs are now supporting, you know, to get app attestations, that's probably a different topic. But in this particular case, um, I would much prefer we sort of push people toward the secure solution. Okay. Any, any, other, any other comments? Any? Okay. So let's try to summarize this one. It sounds like sounds like we're going to in the draft reorder the the list uh, claimed HTTPS URLs first, loopback second, private private URL schemes third. Just at least make sure they're ordered that way. Um, and then just remove the sentence that says that they must, the AS must support the three um, because nobody cares about that requirement, apparently, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> um, and then maybe some fiddling about explaining why they're in a certain order or whatever, but I'm seeing some. Just removing the, the must, the essentially. The, the claimed oh, first. claimed URL first, loopback second, okay. private URI scheme at the bottom. Um, maybe even adding in some text about why you would want to support it at all, um, just to better set the context. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy with that. Okay, good. I believe that's the last slide. No, no? one more? One more? Oh. oh. Just, okay. Um, yes, so those were the three that I wanted to talk about today. I felt like they were more complicated than a lot of the other ones and requires more joint thinking power. So there are, however, a lot more things to talk about. This is not done. Um, and I would very much appreciate more of the discussion happening um, asynchronously on those. So the list I'm keeping track of is here. That is where anything that's open is still 
I'm, I'm going to close it at some point one way or another, but before this is considered done, um, if you want to, to chat on GitHub, that makes it very easy for the editors to keep track of the discussion. I appreciate that. If you are, would rather discuss it on the mailing list, that's fine too. We'll pull it in. Um, but yes, please, we would all appreciate some help with this. There's still quite a bit more to go. So yeah, typically we wanna have those discussions on the mailing list just for the records, right? And, and that's the IETF process. Uh, but yeah, you, you can send those also to, to the mailing list just so for people can go and, and take a look at the GitHub and see what's going on there. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, sort of post the state of the state of the draft to the mailing list um, to let people know what's going on and call out some of those issues. I do feel like some of the issues are relatively minor, so I'm less concerned about about the the whole mailing list record for some of them. Uh, obviously, some of them are a little bit more substantive. Okay, Brian. Sort of following along that, and I only sent an email this morning about it, but the, the idea Get of... Closer, closer from the mic. Damn it. Sorry. Yeah. Only just followed up this morning, but back at the end of last year, there was a thread on the mailing list about the credentialed client type, and kind of nothing ever happened, and it was not... Nothing was done in the latest draft about it, and so I wasn't sure if that was a forgotten about <laughs> or a... Um, when I, I'm, most, I'm mostly just wondering if, yes. like, should I put an issue so it's followed? Or were you going to tell me to screw off? <laughs> um, did did um, it just get forgotten? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, <laughs> how should I proceed in general, I guess? Um, no, do we want to talk about it now? I had completely forgotten about that issue. Um, I guess my recollection of that thread was that there was some discussion and no real resolution to the mailing list thread either. Uh, so I think that's why it sort of died out was it just got lost. But um, adding an issue uh, wouldn't hurt, right? Yeah. To, yeah. To avoid uh, if you, you sort of like yeah, limited yeah. memory. Definitely, definitely. Um, it's so hard to go back through the mailing list and I find know. all of the yeah. threads that are relevant to this draft. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to file it as an issue, then we'll it'll make sure that it's tracked. It's tracked. Okay. Um, and then we can pick up the mailing list thread again too if you want to talk about it there. Um, or we can talk about it now because we, I think we still have time. Yeah, we, yeah, still have we time. actually have time. Yeah. Like if you guys uh, you want to go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no problem. For what it's worth, my recollection is that the issue was more or less was more or less closed. Yeah. So I, I was expecting some action, but that could bias me because that's what I idea. wanted to happen. To fight, to <laughs> so it doesn't mean that it really was resolved that way. But okay. Yeah. Um, so we, we, where um, would that issue be? Brian sent an email today, yesterday, so okay. check, check the archives and it should be uh, pretty recent at the top and hopefully it's in reply to the original one or not? No, of course not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why would you um, use a mailing list with its, I, all of its features? I think that I, I did link it so you okay. could follow through. So is it in the mailing list? If I, if I yeah, 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 it would be at the top of the mailing list. I just quickly to summarize, there's, there had been some, I think confusion about what the, term credential client really meant um, and then on further inspection the actual um, normative requirements around it outside of the section that it was defined uh, qualifies every single usage of it is confidential or credential client must do this confidential or credential client has to authenticate so they are treated uh, as synonymous throughout the document just with more words um, so I, the suggestion from me, and I think others sort of backed it up, was to get rid of the distinction entirely and provide some, some or any discussion around the various levels of trust and establishment and pre-registration and so forth in that, I forget what it is, 2.4 section. Describe the, the nature of it, but keep the two types as they are. Um, so, okay, I remember this. I remember this thread now. Um, yeah. Because we need to... Are you going to try to you going to try to find it for the for the screen? Because otherwise everyone is lost. Oh right. No, he did a good summary of it though. Um, yeah. I just emailed it to me. To me? No. I think I'm done now. 
Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Can you share the screen? Hold on. How do we reshare from maybe this one? Share screen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're gonna have to restart your browser for that one. No kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Let's. It's not gonna work. So. Um, the Brian did a very good summary of the of the state of the issue. Anyway, that was um, that was a good recap of it. Um, my so the original text that's in there. Every time you see the or credentialed in the new text, previously said confidential clients or clients with credentials, which I I personally thought was more confusing because. Elsewhere, it says confidential clients have credentials. Otherwise, a public client doesn't. So that was what it was trying to reconcile was there is, there is something between the two because apparently we can have confidential clients or clients that have credentials that are not confidential clients. And that's already in the original draft. So that's what it was trying to do. So if I agree that maybe the like it could use some more clarification around the conditions under which a client may have credentials that are not, conf it's not a confidential client, that clearly needs to be explained better because that is not obvious in either draft at the moment. But I don't think just reverting back is gonna solve the actual problem. Go ahead, Justin. Justin Richer, so um, Brian's not entirely wrong. Um, the the term is a is definitely a bit confusing that said uh aaron is 100 percent correct that we have more than just confidential client which in the 6749 days was statically configured you know hand registered somebody called a sysadmin to go set up a config file somewhere type of client and then public client, which was just, you get a client ID by calling the sysadmin and having them set that up without a client ID, and that's it. We don't live in that world anymore, and I think it is very, very important for OAuth 2.1 to not only acknowledge that, but also to like embrace that. I personally kind of like the direction of credentialed client as sort of being situated in between. That said, I think we may want to approach this um, in a slightly different way. In that, if the definition of confidential client is simply a client that has a secret that it can keep, right? So a, a client secret or a key set or something like that, and public client does not. So it's a bit of an expansion and clarification of the original definitions without all the assumptions. Then there is an orthogonal dimension of how that confidential client, making sure I'm using the right terms, how that confidential client came into possession of its secrets and under what circumstances. That's what I think credential client was trying to capture, but by putting it on that same dimension, I think, may have been a little confusing. So I think we might actually be able to have a better and more thorough discussion by sort of expanding the, uh, the reach of what confidential client actually means and making sure that when we are talking about confidential clients, if we mean one specific subcategory of that, then we name that subcategory. Because there are different security considerations 
that you have for statically pre-registered web servers versus a, um, a mobile app that gets a secret provisioned on install as part of you know, an install framework versus something that does a full off the street dynamic registration versus the whatever the you know moderna ecosystem does and open banking and stuff with the they're basically they reinvented cas anyway um all of these are very different takes on how to get to that state uh with the goal still being to get to the state where an individual instance of a piece of client software um has access to a secret that can authenticate that instance of client software. And so I think what we might be able to do is to back off in all of the places that say, um, you know, confidential or credentialed or whatever, just say confidential in all of those places. And then in our definition and discussion of what confidential means and how you get there, we expand that discussion significantly. I, I like that for sure. Um, one of the other implications of that is there are also many places to talk about considerations for confidential clients that would need to get qualified further. Yes. Because it would no longer apply to all confidential clients. Yes, absolutely. And bike shedding all of those categories is going to be a mess. There, I, I don't think there's any way around that. Um, I think that uh, having named categories is going to be very helpful for all of those and credentialed client was it was a good stab at that um to to help some of that differentiation okay i see where you're going with that for sure um i think that's i think that's doable brian I think Justin proposed more or less the same thing that I was proposing, which is strange because I thought he was going to disagree with me. <laughs> um, but I do think I think the names are pretty bad, public and confidential. But we're we're sort of stuck with them. And I know personally I've used them in other documents um, that will still be applicable to 2.1. So I would, I, unfortunately, for what they are, I'd prefer them not to be changed. And then it it comes down to um, just better explaining them. And I think that orthogonal access of trust that, that Justin described um, works and gives people the knowledge that they need. But it's not like you wouldn't authenticate a client with credentials just because of the way it was initially established. You're still going to check those credentials. You're still going to, um, so it doesn't, it, back to what I said before, it doesn't change sort of the functional places where you refer both of them and say they have to authenticate but just a description of how sort of the provenance or the trust in the application or client comes to be um, as that ortho orthogonal access of, of yeah. words that you'll come up with that are better than what I'm saying. One of the, one of the other attributes is around whether or not the user gets prompted for consent. There's mm -hmm. like an explicit mention that says public clients should yeah. be, should always be always. prompted even if it's like a first party client. There's something around those lines. Uh, or was the other way around of confidential clients might want to skip the consent phase. I don't remember which one it was and now, uh, but it's, it's not just about the authentication of the client. It's about other implications of how, how much that client is essentially trusted by the AS yeah. based on various things. One of which is it's how it was, how that credential was established. So, but I think you're saying more. I think we're the saying the same thing. thing. And yeah. I, the areas I looked at were the credential, not, for the yeah. other scope. So yeah, there's probably more touch points for clarity, but yeah. but the same thing applies, I think. You know, a client that's registered through an open portal, anybody can is no different than a client that's registered via open dynamic client registration versus dynamic client registration that's done through some sort of um, you know, bespoke access token issuance to get in there in the first place is more trusted maybe than Absolutely. The, so this yeah, and that I'm, kind of touches on the redirect issue it does earlier actually. as yeah, well. It so. does. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm agreeing. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, Dave Tong, Money Hub. Yeah, I'm basically just just to agree. We we had a few issues and people asking, okay, what what is this credential client? And and trying to look through the current draft to see what you actually have to do differently. And and there, apart from that initial 
do you trust the identity? That seemed to be only the only thing as far as I could see. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just very much agree. I think if we can keep it simple and then just call out this, you know, I think Brian made a really good point. It's not all confidential clients are, are equal either in terms of you know, how much trust there is, whether they're just yeah, registering. So, yeah, very much agree with what's said before. Great. George? I'll just add, I, I'm in agreement. Um, the, the dynamic client registration spec um, 5791, no, sorry, 7591. I'm dyslexic this morning. Um, uh, basically implies that when you go through dynamic client registration, you have a confidential client that uses the word confidential client in a few places based on the response. So, um, you know, I think potentially to Brian's point, keeping those words to represent those class of clients makes sense so that we don't introduce a new term. Um, but all of the other points are super valid, right? Just because you have a confidential client doesn't mean that it's trusted. It just means that it can, you know, accurately authenticate itself. Um, and, you know, the other things like, you know, should you show consent or not, um, you know, probably could apply even to some kind of confidential clients if they're not trusted. Um, in the sense of an open, you know, DCR kind of a model. So there's a lot of implications there. Okay, David. Uh, I just wanted to remark that it could be that it's better served by defining new terms. Can possible. you can you speak up, David? Can you speak sure. up, please? Get closer so to the mic, to, maybe. I just wanted to say that it may be better to define new terms, possibly in axes. Uh, we, can, we can barely hear you. Hmm. That's funny. I, I hear myself in feedback pretty loudly, actually. Better? Um, Keep going, David. Okay. Keep going. I just wanted to say that it might be better to define new terms, possibly multiple terms, to define different facets. Because otherwise, everywhere we use public and confidential, we're going to have to revisit those, such as binding registration, to make sure our reading of the older term, breaking any newer them. I didn't get that. Um, David, can you send that in a, in a message to to them in the chat, or did was, you get? I think I got it. I was going to okay. echo it. Okay, go then, ahead, Dave, Brian. And then argue against it at the same time. <laughs> he, I, I believe that DW was saying that it would be better to introduce completely new terms because the existing terms are used throughout different documents um, and possibly multiple axes of terms to to cover these things. I speak up now maybe if I'm wrong about that, David. Um, and I would I would flip it the other way because these terms are used throughout a number of documents that are not touched directly by OAuth 2.1, mm -hmm. but will still be compatible with 2.1, and it's all of its framework. Um, as bad as the names are, I, I think they should remain the same so that they don't introduce further breakage or confusion with, with those documents. David, do you have any comment? Okay. Don't see David and Mike again. Okay, Vittorio. Vittorio. Okay. Um, I am a bit concerned about uh, post hoc uh, redefining uh, some of those terms. Um, although it would be handy to say anything that has a credential is confidential, uh, in uh, practical use, uh, many systems are predicated on the idea that a confidential client is a singleton and the infrastructure and the service and the programming model which is offered to the developers is based on that and in fact the confusion tied to that is also observable when people try to use such systems for iot or similar in which they try to distribute the credential to clients but to a scale which wasn't designed for so long story short i think that if we decide to generalize uh, the term of confidential client to anything that has a credential with no regard with uh, whether it's single tone or not whether uh, the assignment of this credential was done in a circumstance in which you would have uh, 
some, uh, how to say, extra insurance that uh, you knew something about the registrar. Um, then uh, I think that uh, um, we, we needed to like, uh, convince ourselves that we will not break or that we will not create even further confusion and uh, um, potentially uh, contradict ourselves. Because like, uh, although we never said, I believe, anywhere that this thing represents a single tone, uh, originally this thing was websites, which were naturally, and then everything else was somewhat derived from that. Uh, so long story short, I guess I'm saying uh, I, I'm a bit worried about making uh, that sweeping uh, generalization because uh, of uh, potential side effects. And given that I have a mic, I'll also say that uh, to me it's odd that we might uh, I'd say excuse uh, confidential clients uh, from uh, showing consent, but instead asking to uh, public clients to do so. Because uh, public clients today, unless you use uh, tricks like URLs, uh, uh, claim the URLs and similar, they are a travesty. Like you can use whatever client ID you want and pretend to be someone else. So asking for a consent in that particular case in which you have very little confidence that the bits that are running are actually representing the thing that was registered as a client it seems somewhat contradictory. But that was an, an aside. The TLDR is, uh, let's be careful about generalizing what a, a confidential client is. Brian? I understand what was just said, but the generalization matches the reality of, I, I believe what was written in 6749, some of those cases you discussed are due to some of the prior weirdness of the various editors and taking over and so forth. Um, I think it's, it's pretty widely accepted that confidential clients are those with credentials regardless of how they've gotten them. And again, I've certainly written a number of documents that say that and rely specifically on that. So I don't think we're redefining anything. And provenance of trust and Chris, like the reason right or wrong, the reason that lack of consent is allowed for confidential clients is because the picking up of the actual what's consented, the access tokens is restricted to that client. Yes, the initial authorization request can be anything, but because they have to authenticate, because the callback only goes to a registered URL, that's why they're allowing for that, that part to be skipped, at least in the text, I believe is what it said. So it's not quite the right comparison, unless I'm missing something. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so on the, whether it matches the reality, I'm not sure, let's say that the, that's what we might have placed uh, on the specs. But uh, if you look at practical usage, for example, if you look at what uh, some of the Twitter clients do when you install it on Windows, that's a public client, as in it has the same ID in every installation. But then in the moment in which you install this thing, you get a key. So you still have one entry, but uh, and it behaves like a public client. It is a public client. It's an, a native uh, uh, thing running on the desktop, but you do get a key. So. Although we might not have, uh, uh, to say, formalized that particular flow, but that thing behaves uh, just like uh, the credentialed client that you attempted to place into that one. So I think it's a bit more nuanced than uh, the reality is, uh, um, like that uh, anything that has a credential is a confidential client in reality. In fact, like, I think there are a number of practical examples in which uh, that is not the case. On the other one about the consent, uh, I don't want to rat hole, so we can discuss offline. I think the uh, I think what you just said was actually relevant to the thing that Justin mentioned, which is that the w the other factors of what the system is doing with this client is what's dependent on how that that secret was obtained, mm -hmm. and the fact is that it has a secret, and most of the things in the spec are things like if you have a secret, use it things like that. So uh, I, was I, who's, who's left yeah. on the queue? George. George. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So I, I guess um, I don't want public clients, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what you were saying, Vittorio, but I don't want public client definition to mean a native app, right? Because if my client on the native app 
can basically create a public private key pair where the private key is stored in the TPM of the device, right? And, and then it can use that for proving its identity when it makes calls. I don't think that should be considered a public client. Um, in, in that context, right, it's something different. And I worry about labeling that as a public client. Um, so if, if we're basically just saying public clients are, I always, for me, in going through this over the last bunch of years, right, I always looked at public clients as those clients that can't protect a secret. And a confidential client is a client that can protect a secret. Mm -hmm. So if the client can protect a secret, and when we were talking about dynamic client registration, you know, the expectation was the secret is instant specific, and therefore it can kind of protect it because it's the secret itself is not embedded in the binary. Um, someone to get it would have to jailbreak the device itself to get access to the instant specific piece. Um, then that would be considered a confidential client. So, you know, maybe the problem we have here is that we have a bunch of, you know, different interpretations of what these terms mean. And, you know, we're trying to sort that out and it has ripple effects as Brian's pointed out against existing specs. But I, you know, that has been my interpretation. Confidential clients are ones that can successfully protect a secret. Public clients are ones who can't regardless of where they're running. Good, Vitor. Great. So uh, I think that this, uh, this discussion is really an excellent example of uh, clearly we have different uh, points of view and different interpretation of how this thing went. Because uh, for me, uh, being very pragmatic and having to deal from the developer side, the main difference is that uh, there is only one Twitter website, but there are millions of Twitter installations like uh, everyone on the phone have their own instance. And then whoever Twitter decides that they want to identify a particular instance or not, it's up to them. So I can model the Twitter client using a public client. And then if I want some extra guarantee, I can find a way of also assigning a key so that uh, although I still have the same client ID and the client ID is the thing that uh, deals with the nature of a client, I have those extra guarantees in which I can recognize the instance. Now, I can't claim that this is uh, normative because uh, this stuff is not covered. All I'm saying is uh, this is the way in which I've been operating and uh, helping customers model things or observing others modeling their own system. To me, this just points to the fact that uh, if we go in the direction of saying no, now we formally want to say that anything that has a credential is a confidential client, then we needed to be explicit and saying, okay, if you were doing the thing that I just described, in which you have those enhanced public clients, in which uh, you can recognize the instances of a client, but they all have the same client ID, you needed to distinguish these from singletons, in which when you have a website, then uh, uh, it's just one. And so let's use it in a different way. Let's call it uh, confidential client plus plus or max or 365, depending on the company. <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, credential client, perfect. So uh, just wanted to clarify. Active client, Active client, no, Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, the Microsoft jokes in this room. Um, uh, Justin Richer, once again. Uh, I think Victoria, uh, that, <laughs> sorry, you were saying all lunch about how everybody gets your name wrong and i've known you for years i think vittorio and i actually do agree violently in different directions um so everything that he just described about um how you have this special class of uh public client that's not acting like a public client i would call that a confidential client that's not acting like a statically registered confidential client and that's why I really think we do need this, this different dimension in order to talk about these things. Um, I'm with George and with the, the language that we have in dynamic registration that said, once you get the credential, then you are a confidential client. Like that was, that was one of the, the selling points of dynamic registration was it was take your public client and turn it into a confidential client in a way that OAuth could actually think about it being a confidential client. We have all the security caveats that this is not the same as a statically registered one. 
And then with software statements and registration jots and all of that other stuff, people have bootstrapped a lot of other layers of trust on, on top of that as well to have even more gradients here of trust. However, at the end of the day, it is presenting a credential of some type, be it a client secret or something else. Now, I do think that it is interesting if you vary the client ID per instance or not, and what that actually means. That should be part of this discussion. That should, however, not be part, I would argue, of the definition of what makes a public or confidential client, right? Because if I decide to give everybody the same client ID, everybody in the world the exact same client ID, and differentiate them based on their keys instead, I could write that system. It's kind of a dumb idea in OAuth world because so much is leveraged on the client ID, that public identifier. Was that? Yeah, that's what Twitter did. That's what a, that's what a bunch of other uh, things out there have done. And um, Google, di Google did that back in the OAuth one days as well with their weird X auth extension thing, whatever that was called. Uh, regardless, the point being that I don't think that this should be wrapped around the client identifier at all. Um, I do think that it does make sense to collapse down to these two categories if we can then have this larger discussion about how you got into that category. What and, That is really what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of factors about clients that you want to treat differently depending on a lot of different things, none of which have to do with whether or not it has a secret. Yes, exactly. And it applies to both clients with and without a secret. All those factors apply to both clients. So I don't know. Right. It seems like it seems like there's two different issues going on. One, I agree, let's let's simplify the terms. And then two, there's a lot of stuff we need to talk about. Like there's mm -hmm. more things to add about these different considerations. And everything that I've heard is definitely like a good thing to to bring in as a hey, if you know you have this situation, and I think some of that exists in the current draft. But it was more more tied to the public or confidential type, which, as we've seen, is not actually the correct place to tie it. Right. So, yeah, we should be making we should be making distinctions when there actually is a difference between things. And in a lot of the discussion that I've noticed here today, a lot of the decisions being made are actually decisions that are on top of the OAuth protocol, and not within the OAuth protocol itself. You know, back to Aaron's point of any time uh, that it shows up in the text, it's basically saying, if you have credentials, present them and verify them. And then what you do from that point is a different question that you answer with different information. So Vittorio's concern was ripple effects of redefining the term. And I think that's something that's worth paying attention to, but I don't necessarily think it's uh, a deal breaker. I don't think it's something that's going, that we should stop yeah. and revert this plan. So yeah, proceed with caution, proceed with caution uh, and, and I'm happy to keep that in mind as we work on these changes. Okay, we have two minutes here and uh, I want to allow George to, Great. to get into the mic. George? Sure, I'll be real quick. I think, Vittorio, your model is a really interesting one and actually surprisingly so the, one I've heard. Right. When I think about dynamic client registration, I always think about issuing each instance of a client its own client ID. And specifically, that's so that I can block that a particular client instance um, separated. Now, you could do that by the key as well, right? So I, I would like, you know, I guess for me, the question is, is where do we have these larger conversations about models? Because um, I think it's super important, right? We probably have some best practices or some patterns for the way things are implemented. And you know, does that go into a spec? Do we pull that out into something else? But I think that would be really helpful for developers to understand that there are multiple models, and um, and you know the pros and cons of doing you know things one way or another. Okay. Any? Do you want to wrap up? I'm. I'm um, that's it. I'm happy with this discussion. Okay. Thank you. It was very productive. Um, I've got my homework cut yeah. out for me. Awesome. So, yeah. Good. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Yeah, great discussion. Thank you all.
Uh, we are done for today, um, but uh, we still have three more sessions. So two side meetings and we have Thursday also as an official meeting. Okay, see you there. Go ahead, Mike. Last, last minute. Mike Jones, are the side meetings on the list? Could, or if not, could you do that? I, I sent it to the list, I think. I, I will send it to the list. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. Thank you all. Including where they are. Yes, we will do. Good to see you, man. Oh, yeah. As long as it doesn't say confidential, do not share. <laughs> You're good. You're good. It's just. Okay, good. <laughs> Like my, you look yeah, at this, look man, at you did amazing. How, can we mute this thing? No, no, no that's right. Thank you. <laughs> we should, we should <laughs> ask. Time, but yeah. No, 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 but, 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 but you know, like it's, uh, if you don't know where people are in, yeah. 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 Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, great discussion. Absolutely awesome. It's like, uh, <laughs> I'm going for ages. <laughs> Too many video calls. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, Peter. How are you? <laughs> yeah, just upgrade to Ich hätte mit äh, Volunteeren sollen ein Meeting-Skat zu machen. <lacht>